finally know what's up with those dual Leica cameras on the Huawei P9. Will LG build quality concerns sink the G5? And are we witnessing the end of the BlackBerry brand? Another week of mobile tech news has passed, and we're going to talk about all of it. So make sure you're charged and ready for episode 195 of the Pocket Now Weekly. This weekly show is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, that make our lives work. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables, it's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid playing outside until the streetlights came on. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at PocketNow.com, blasting the signal from a somewhat gloomy Southern California day. And rounding out this techie trio, we're joined by chief news editor Stephen Shank in New Jersey. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, oh my God, have you, have you seen this? Do you see what this is? We started on time today. I don't think this <laughs> ever happened in like, the history of the Pocket Now Weekly. Like within the first five or ten minutes, yeah, but two on the dot no, early actually. This is this is amazing. Well, I mean that live signal went up at ten fifty nine, the little yeah. live icon on on the hangout. Yeah. So I, I'm having a proud of us moment. I'm Woo-hoo. I'm thinking this is going to be a good show. And just you know, fair warning for all of the people listening, I'm sick as a dog. So I'm hoping my voice holds out, but I'll also try not to do any disgusting bodily nasal clearing sounds in front of my microphone. Being here. sick is fantastic for voiceovers. You get that fantastic uh, timber to your voice. Well, I get my cool guy voice, yeah, but there's do. no way to replicate it. So if I were to do an audition now, there, and I were to book the job and then get well... Just like I, keep I, licking doorknobs like the entire week before you have to. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's so gross. Yeah. And of course, rounding out uh, is a podcast producer, Jules Wong. He'll be frantically hacking the mainframe to keep this podcast running smooth. The time on the West Coast is 11 a.m. So, folks, uh, we've got a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into the show proper. Uh, here at the Pocket Now Weekly, we have great advertisers. You know, we have these sponsors that support the show, and that's what keeps it free. You know, so that's wh- how we can keep producing the show, distributing the show, and giving you guys uh, some fun stuff to listen to. Um, now, one of the reasons why advertisers like working with us on the weekly is that they know we have an incredible audience, um, and so to help us pair up with the right sponsors. Uh, those companies that have products and services that you all might be interested in, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it if you take a quick survey. Uh, we have a survey set up by podsurvey.com. The full website is podsurvey.com slash pocket now. Um, so this should take less than five minutes. Uh, it's going to ask you some questions about your uh, about yourself. You know, so you know, be you know, share about yourself. You, uh, you can use this as like a little psychology time. Just tell us uh, all about your relationship with your parents, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> what else? What you uh, what what you like to buy? What services you like to use? But it's all completely anonymous. Um, so uh, your answers to this survey help us pair up with other uh, advertisers. So you know, it's it's a uh, we're we're really trying to make sure that when we are working with sponsors on the show, that we're we're doing a good job of uh, matching interests to the people who watch our show. And when you're finished with the survey, uh, they have a monthly drawing. Uh, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card. I mean, that's so pretty tempting. I think we should combine this, though, with like a matchmaking service as well. Like, tell us a little <laughs> about your marketing preferences and, you know, find someone who's compatible with those, you know? Well, it's like our previous sponsor, Benjamin, you know, like, uh, you might win a $100 Amazon gift card, and if you swipe right, you might find your Russian bride. There you go. <laughs> So even if you've taken a podcast listener survey before, we'd, we'd greatly appreciate it if you take ours also. Uh, it helps support this show, and maybe you'll be lucky enough to win that, uh, that $100 gift card. You know, more entries, more, uh, more chances to win that gift card. Sure. So from all of us here at the Pocket Now Weekly, uh, thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for the interactions, the people that have been engaged with our show for, for the years that it's been on the air. And, uh, and thanks also for helping us find good advertisers. You know, we want to make sure that we're, we're working with sponsors that, that you know, sort of we represent well and that represent us well so that we can keep the lights on here. Once again, that website, uh, that, that link is podsurvey.com slash pocket now. Uh, check out that survey, and you'll be uh, you'll be doing us a solid. We'll feel the love here at the yeah, Pocket Now Weekly. Those of you who are just listening to this and aren't watching the video, uh, in the background behind Juan, keeping the lights on here, is it's no short order here. There is a, <laughs> a like, baker's dozen of uh, points of illumination behind him there. Those aren't cheap, folks. 
Right. I mean, CFLs are spendy, and I've got an LED or light work. panel back there. Every every week that we do the show, it's also kind of funny. I can't move my webcam right now because it's just going to mess up the precarious environment on my desk. But okay. there are four LEDs, uh, not LEDs, there are four CFL light bulbs pointing right at my face. I basically end every broadcast with just, like, the worst... Like hazy, <laughs> you see spots everywhere. Spots everywhere. Yeah, it's just yeah. terrible. It's good. But like you were saying, uh, when we say it helps us keep the lights on, we're that's not figurative. <laughs> that's <laughs> literal. So uh, before we get into more of the tomfoolery this week, uh, Mr. Shank, would you be so kind as to explain to our listeners and our viewers how they might be able to get in touch with us? Abso Paza, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, well, obviously, we, we need to hear from you guys here. Uh, we have a lot to talk about on the show, as we always do. And, and we're going to try to keep things on track, but if you know we meander off course a little, if there's something that happened in the news that we're just missing and you want us to comment on, if you have a question and want us to clarify something we've been talking about earlier, uh, let us know. Uh, if you're watching live, the way to do that is the Q&A tab at Google Hangouts. Just jump over to that. Type up your question, and uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, other viewers will vote up their favorites. This is a popularity contest, but, you know, everything in life kind of is. So, so write a good one there so it gets a lot of attention and, uh, you know, grabs ours. Uh, other way you can reach us if you're listening to the show later on and you're not uh, tuning in for the live broadcast. Or, you know, it's just something that's not really uh, super timely. If you want us to think about, meander over, and give you a well-thought answer, the way to do that is shooting us an email, podcast at pocketnow.com the address for that. So either podcast.pocketnow.com email or the Google Hangouts Q&A. One or the other, we need to hear from you guys. So uh, go ahead and uh, make it happen. Make it happen. Truth. Because that's how we're going to That's how we're gonna know that we're covering the topics that you guys want to talk about is if you're a part of the uh, discussion. Now before we jump into all of the stories from our rundown, I, I'm actually throwing Stephen Angels here a little bit of a curveball because this just popped what? up after... I mean, no, like... No, I'm bailing. This is Within minutes. No, jeez, guys, leave us, Stephen. Uh, and, mm. and, and honestly, I mean, at some point, Google's going to kick you out anyway. So. <laughs> this is very, very true. <laughs> so uh, this, this just popped up um, on the Twitters, actually. So this is one of my biggest pet peeves, is when tech bloggers like ourselves uh, start doing things with tech stories where they're inserting opinion while delivering news. I love doing that. I don't get to write editorials anymore. I have to kind of backdoor it. <laughs> oh. So okay, so so a little a little you know sort of a, a little flavor, a little spice. I think that's totally appropriate. What, but what it's when we start doing here? things like applying motive to companies, you know, when you see people like, oh, Apple's only doing this to make a profit. Like that's a bad. Well, thing. it's a publicly traded company. All it does is. Make a <laughs> And so there, there was a story that we put out, and um, it, it came courtesy of uh, of Adrian, um, our our editor Adrian, who actually is one of my favorite writers on the site because yeah, he's he, good people. Well, because he's spiky and he never has anything nice to say about Microsoft. Oh no! <laughs> I, you can't see my feet here. The lights over here just flicker. This could be this could be a fun. Oh, right on! This is going to be exciting. So, guys, this is going to be a great. A great episode. I can feel it already. But anyway, so Adrian, yeah, Adrian. wrote out this um this article about the uh, there was a leak for the Samsung Gear 360. It's that ball of a 360 degree camera that Samsung's putting out. It's going to compete against the LG uh, 360 degree cam solution that's that's coming out. Soon. Oh, this was oh this is the B and H posted the price right. Exactly, and so yeah. B and H apparently leaked a price um of three hundred and fifty dollars for this this product. And this is where I start to get a little frustrated with the way that we geeks, and, and I'm not calling out Adrian, I mean, like, I think we've all been guilty of this at some point, is um, when we start trying to, like, price project. You know, like, well, 350 that's not worth it for the money, and it should really only be $17 and a half a ham sandwich. That's well. what the product really costs. Okay, we do have points of comparison here, though. B&H, it should be noted, it was the same company we got uh, our first pricing data from, U.S. pricing data, for all of LG's accessories surrounding the G5, including yeah. its own uh, 360 degree camera thing. So they sold that for 200 bucks. I mean, we can make some comparison there, saying... So we, we can't kind no, of no, assume no. that it'd be a little closer to the LG unit. No, no, no. I, I totally, I totally agree with the sentiment that we can make a comparison, but that's different than making a price projection on what this thing should cost. Mm. Then you're not, you're not really making the comparison. You're saying for all of the features that Samsung has built into this, this is the dollar amount that you should spend on it, and that's different than saying a three hundred and fifty dollars Samsung Gear, uh, Samsung Gear three hundred and sixty. 
has these features which are actually better than the LG solution, so shouldn't it cost more than the LG solution? You know, so like, yeah, I, I, I know I'm splitting hairs a little bit there, but, but there, I do feel that there's a difference between outright saying it's not worth it unless it were this price as opposed to in the market it competes against this. And so, and then also, I mean, like, uh, th- it just turns out that this story's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I we mean, saw some uh, Samsung PR person speak up, like, nah. I got to say the nano on that great. one. So, so Philip Byrne, he's a, he's a guy I've actually met up with at some trade shows. Um, and and, and he, is, he wasn't calling us out, but he, he could have, because we posted the exact same story. Um, he, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's also sharing his Twitter feed right now, where he's uh, Philip is actually bragging about shutting down another uh, tech blogger about yeah, this. Burn here, burn. Yeah, burn. And so he doesn't. He's not confirming pricing. He's not. He's not telling us what the pricing is, but he's telling us that the pricing is not three hundred and fifty dollars. But even for the sake of argument, the one thing I wanted to try and point out is, mm-hmm. say the Gear three hundred and sixty was three hundred and fifty dollars. And we're saying somehow that's not worth it. Yeah, watch so, it be like three forty nine ninety nine or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, and, and actually, I could totally see, Phil. Phil is actually pretty spicy too, so I could see him uh, messing around with some people by doing something like that. Even though that would ultimately be a bad play in the long run. But the the point I'm trying to make is, we're not really looking at the product. We're not really saying what the product is. And so, right now, if, Stephen, if I were to put you on the spot, how much would it cost? to buy a non-360 degree action camera that can shoot UHD video? Oh, jeez, I have no idea. Um, in the, well, like a crap one? I mean, like, get, uh, so, like, sort of something that you would actually want to share the footage from, not I just... Guess, like, I was reading, because I'm, like, sort of in the market for these. I was considering when Monoprice had its uh, first action cam, but the reviews were pretty bad. Uh, there's <laughs> one out there that's going for, like, 80 that's kind of rubbish. It doesn't have a screen or anything, but <laughs> right. I don't know. Under two hundred dollars, I'd say, for yeah. UHD video on uh, yes. on an action camera and one yes. that okay. I'm not so, paying GoPro prices. I'm no fool. Okay, so that's that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Is if if we were looking at a GoPro, we'd be talking four ninety nine. Well, yeah, but that's right? cuckoo bananas. So so Samsung can't command a GoPro price. I think I think we can fairly say the GoPro the name, GoPro, GoPro can't brand, per, can't command a GoPro price anymore. They are tanking. Well, but I mean, like in in terms of that name almost becoming Kleenex. You know what I mean? Like yeah, okay. every little action camera is a GoPro. But there are enough industry professionals, like out here in California, like all of your B roll, your action, your your action footage, your uh, your driving plates, they're all GoPros. Now. I didn't realize that uh, that the first person uh, hardcore movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, filmed on like a GoPro thing. Mostly uh, GoPros, yeah. Yeah. So, so again, I mean, like, I think GoPro is saying, you know, for their for their top of the line camera, they're looking at more professional applications. So that means it's four ninety nine. So Samsung can't command that kind of a price for a three hundred and sixty degree camera. But we're talking two image sensors, not just one on the GoPro. Yeah. And even if it were three hundred and fifty dollars, that's still kind of in the ballpark because that's still cheaper than the HD only GoPro the the GoPro Silver. So Yeah, but you know GoPro it has these markets in industries making media. Mm-hmm. I think Samsung's really positioning this as a consumer device here. I don't I, see, I think well I I agree you went to the, but... the launch thing. How oh, are they yeah, pushing yeah. it there? Well, so Samsung is definitely a consumer facing company, but I think they're looking at this as maybe a crossover product. Mm. It's an easy way to introduce 360 degree video because the other solutions are are usually multi camera solutions where you have to like stitch together the footage from like six different GoPros. Sure, sure. So for smaller productions, like you know, when you're saying this that what is that movie? It's like Harry Hardcore or something like that. Hardcore Henry? Which something? sounds like a porno and now I really regret saying that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it sounds but, like a nineteen ninety two DOS game. <laughs> it totally is like some some wannabe Duke Nukem, um, yeah. but but when we're when we're looking at at what this thing brings to the table and the fact that it it is going to have better image quality for video than LG solution, I I feel that that's an appropriate pricing comparison. Like I think the Gear 360 should cost more than LG's product. They're not the same thing. They're not apples to apples. It it, it just looks a lot better. It seems like it's built a little more solidly just from what I've seen. I would pay more for it. I don't know that I'd pay $150 more for it. I mean, that's actually absolutely a fair comparison. But the other thing I would say is 
is uh, when we're looking at the uh, the robustness of the uh, of the ecosystem. The Samsung robustity. has a much uh, a much uh, longer uh, track record of building out cameras and pairing them with phones. I mean, even my Samsung mirrorless camera, my NX30, has a great app. To actually, that's Philip right there. He was he was at that event, so that's Phil Byrne um, in all his spicy glory. Oh. Um, but uh, even my Samsung NX30 has a terrific app to pair with my phone, and a lot of mirrorless you know uh, camera manufacturers can kind of boast about that too. Uh, but Samsung has been doing it a lot longer than LG has, so that's another thing too that I would expect them to get right very very quickly. So that was just my little pet peeve. Sounds on our own. Yeah. For our own art, for our own site. I mean, again, this, I'm not even calling out anyone else who posted on. This. When you got it's a just, soapbox, this is what you do. You step up. <laughs> I do. I do do that a lot, don't I? I need to be careful with that. Mm. <laughs> well, we should probably get into the actual news from the week. Uh, yeah. Tools right on top of that music stab. So, uh, Mr. Shank. From what I understand, there was a pretty big Huawei announcement, and uh, we've got some pretty cool optics and imaging news to talk about. Yeah, uh, I guess it was our second big Huawei uh, event. Do we have an MWC one? Well, Huawei uh, has been looking, or we've been looking forward to their P9 flagship for a while now. Uh, seeing the phone pop up, it, it's been leaked uh, pretty heavily. We had a really good sense of what to expect from the phone coming into this, and the company did that at a point. Uh, the main selling point of this uh, a P9 is the dual Leica branded cameras on the back here. Uh, dual cameras feel like they're all over the place this year, mm -hmm. and if the iPhone 7 rumors we've been hearing uh, end up holding out, then uh, this is just going to be a bigger thing, and everyone's doing it a little bit differently. With G5, we have that like narrow field of view, wide angle thing, uh, Huawei's doing it a little differently. Uh, we're looking at two sensors with the same resolution right next to each other, but one of them's a full color sensor and one of them is a black and white sensor. And I wrote this whole thing up. I didn't even, I mean, it's a great idea because uh, anytime you're sampling color, you get a lot less you know, light information because, mm -hmm. or brightness information uh, because you're trading off or using filters to you know, downsample that light to just look at spectrums of the wavelength there and you lose some of your information, so when you have just the pure brightness from the black and white one to combine that with, you get a more vibrant picture, you get one that's going to have more detail, especially in low light environments, and one of the commenters pointed out, this is a fantastic comparison, this is just like how our eyes work. We have mm -hmm. you know, the rods and the cones, the color sensitive and the brightness sensitive, and we combine the output from both of these to form an image in our occipital lobes there, and that's just what the P9 is doing. So we can do some really cool tricks um, beyond just making very vibrant photos. You can, for instance, just take pictures with the, uh, the black and white camera there for like really, really sharp looking, you know, classic photography shots. Uh, there's a whole bunch of trick modes it has on here that I didn't even go into in the uh, news announcement here. Um, there's the P9 and the P9 Plus, the 5.2 incher and 5.5, 5.7, right. I have a whole spec thing here. 5.5, uh, LCD on the smaller, OLED on the bigger, which is nice. Um, but it's really great seeing how there's not a lot of differences between these two here. Uh, if you guess, you know, some people don't like the largest phones, some people prefer something a little more fabulity. Yeah, the size difference isn't huge between them, but there is that, you know, little bit of wiggle room there. If you want something that you you can just reach a little bit further up to the top when you're doing one-handed. You can go with a straight-up P9. Uh, also, the P9 gives you a little more variability in terms of specs. You can get a 3-gig, 32-gigabyte storage model uh, and save a little money there, but it's not much more an upgrade. I think it's 50 bucks more will get you the 4-gig, 64-gigabyte one. And the P9 uh, Plus, I say Pro before, Plus is just in the 4-gigabyte <laughs> configuration there. Um, and we had uh, euro prices. We haven't heard anything about avail excuse me, availability in the States. Uh, uh, they're going to be selling in a bunch of European countries as well as Middle East and Egypt. I guess Egypt's still the Middle East. Starting uh, middle of April-ish. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, this is super cool news. And, and again, it, it, like, just to kind of reiterate the, the point here, this is the first... Uh, I, and I love that the commercial has a whole bunch of like celebrities in it too. This 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 uh, release video that they put out, but that this is the first major collaboration between Huawei and Leica, and I'm not surprised that this is the track they went down, as opposed to doing what LG did with a wide-angle lens and a uh, sort of a, a more standard field of view, 
that these are two of the same field of view, but that one is a dedicated light sensor. I mean, if, if you know anything about Leica photography, rangefinder cameras, I mean, uh, Leica has this brand reputation for just top-tier photos. And so I'm really curious to see if this even influences video, you know, if, if we see the same kinds of image manipulation happening with one sensor just picking up nothing but light information for video and the other just picking up color and that could actually address some of the issues that we've got with smartphone video. I, I wrote an article on uh, pocketnow.com trying to explain why UHD video looks better than HD video. Right, the 4 to, watch it. 4 to 1. Exactly. And so you, when we start talking about that kind of like uh, color down sampling and image compression, you know, there's the potential for something like this to really do some cool stuff for producing higher quality images. It's not just a, like, like with HTC, I really felt that their uh, duo sensor on the M8 was a bit gimmicky. We want to do really fun tricks to blur out the background. I don't see Huawei and Leica really focusing in on that as much as they are the core photography experience in trying to deliver just the most uh, pristine images that they can from the back of a smartphone. Yeah, there's all sorts of... I'm just, beyond just using the dual sensors to get better quality pics, the camera's also doing it so you can take these pics better, uh, specifically in terms of uh, focus. And there's a dedicated chip on there that's doing depth measurements to help with focus. It has laser as well and standard contrast. Combine the three of these, it'll find like the fastest one to get the, the shot as quickly as it can. Um, I just thought that was a novel way of not just having, not just using this for like special effects, but also getting some you know, real... Oh, ab absolutely. And I, and I think that was, a, that was a problem moving from the HTC M7 to the M8 is that it felt like they walked away from the core photography experience yeah. in making these sort of gimmicks. So we have a, we have a, a question here from Kyle Ruggles. It's actually a bit more of a, of a comment. Kyle's a, a buddy of mine. He's a, he's a really good photographer. Um, and his question, my question is, clip on wide-angle lenses. I doubt that'll work. Mm -hmm. And I can't see how it could. Uh, these, these sensors are so close together. These lenses are so close together that even if we were to maybe have one giant lens that we could clip onto the back of the phone, um, I just don't see yeah, how that could no. work. <laughs> and then I don't see how you could make a wide-angle lens for each individual sensor because they, they're they too close together. So, you could have, like, two little periscopes that space it out. and then <laughs> <laughs> Little prisms that stick yeah. out. Yeah! Uh, we, we, we could, yeah, I, I guess something like that might work. No, I can't see them doing anything like that because I feel I feel like Leica as a company, anything that sat in front of their lenses would be deemed um, unacceptable, you know, for just producing the, the best possible image quality. I, I, I think they're probably going to walk away from that idea. And it's important, I mean, if you're, we're talking about putting on lenses, yeah, these being so close together becomes an issue, but it's important they are as close together as they are, because otherwise you're going to get parallax effects in there, and you're going to start to lose some of the benefits mm -hmm. that you're going to get from having the, the data from two sensors that gives you essentially the same shot. Well, and, and, I, and I think this is also going to be a really interesting examination to see if, um, like, like how image stabilization is handled. Uh, syncing up dual sensors is kind of tricky. Um, that's a lot of stuff to move around with different lenses and different um, different sensor combinations. And uh, if we're just going to be looking at some kind of like crop stabilization, like what we mm. have on an iPhone, or if there is any hardware in there that can help take out some of the hand movements or some of the jiggles, um, I, I don't see anything in there that states specifically how stabilization might be achieved on this. So I'm thinking I don't recall seeing anything about that on the spec sheet they put out. Maybe there's more detailed information available now. There were a bunch of holes in the specs when they first arrived, and I'm looking to get more information on these guys. And hopefully we'll actually have these things starting to filter out into the market soon. One more quick uh, Q&A on this from Emil. With the new collaboration between Leica and Huawei, do you think we'll see more collaborations between cell phone makers and specialized camera companies like Nikon and Canon? What do you think, Stephen? I, I am not feeling too strongly about that happening only because there have been so many opportunities already and I mean it's not like 
making imaging a priority in smartphones is something that's new. Uh, we're putting a heavier focus, or it seems we're paying more attention to it now, I think mainly because the rest of phone development has gotten to a state of maturity, and now we're looking for other ways to help differentiate uh, flagship models. But uh, no, I can't see these companies... I mean, they've had years now to you know, get in with <laughs> right. the company while, you know, while it was still small to you know, put their money into help building up its its uh, camera reputation. And no, I, I'm not sure what it would be in it for them. Right now, these companies that have survived in the, the digital market, uh, digital uh, photography game, which has, you know, companies have fallen by the wayside. Kodak tried to make digital cameras. Uh, that did not work out. It's, you know, gone up in smoke. Uh, and the companies that have survived, I think, have been successful on the really, really high end. Uh, you know, the ones that do professional, prosumer, uh, those are the brands you pay attention to now. No one cares what the new point-and-shoot from Sony is. Right. Um, and I wonder if they might diminish their brand a little by by latching on to... You know, it, it's surprising almost that Leica is getting involved to the extent that it is. I can understand when like lens makers were, like the Carl Zeiss stuff we saw, because that's... You know, you know, you don't have as much on the line when you're just responsible for that one, uh, the part of right, one but, component. But on the phone. it's like the boutique companies, not not the major players like the Canons and the Nikon's, but the boutique. I would say Leica is high-end boutique, and it looks like they're really trying to get in in what might be a new market for them. You know, I but can't I tell if Leica's really good right. cameras or just really expensive cameras. Uh, that's tough. I mean, it's it, it, it's. Uh, it's not just whether or not you have a really good camera. It's it's a part of the brand. It's part of the identity. It's what that camera does and how that camera does it. So I know. get a very Apple vibe from like from like. Oh, I, I, I think that's absolutely fair. But th but for those Leica devotees, even though they know that like a Leica rangefinder digital camera is mostly Panasonic guts, that the way that that sensor is tuned, the lenses that that thing interacts with, the image processing that that happens to those photos is is very specific to a Leica. So it's more than just, you know, do you get the same micro four-thirds image sensor? It, 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 you know what I, I mean? I see it's what you're saying. Fine details. Yeah. So, I, I, but, but I, think, I think you're totally right that a Canon or a Nikon is looking at the smartphone market and they're probably thinking that that would dilute their brand. They don't see it as competition, I'm sure. Well, because, like, Nikon actually did toy with Android-powered point-and-shoot cameras and they crashed and burned. They, they don't know how to make an Android device. They know how to make cameras. But I think where we'll see them trying to interact with mobile devices is, uh, you know, we were talking about the Samsung Gear 360. Um, Nikon is also putting out their own 360-degree camera, and we have to believe that like a GoPro or like a Kodak or like the Gear 360 or the LG, that it's going to have some type of interaction with mobile devices. It's going to have uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC, so being able to tap and pair with an Android device, use your phone as a viewfinder, and then using Nikon, Nikkor optics in a tiny little waterproof, this thing's actually going to be waterproof Ooh. too, a waterproof 360-degree camera stands to be an interesting way that Nikon can get into this market without actually having to build stuff for a smartphone, you know, building stuff into a smartphone. So I think that's actually how Canon and Nikon are looking at the future of their brand in participating with mobile devices. I think that leaves them separate enough, but they have solutions that consumers can find to still use Nikon labels and Canon labels on things. You know, this is neither here nor there, but we've got to come up with a better word for these spherical cameras here. I mean, 360 degrees, that's like panoramic. That's on a flat plane. Right. <laughs> some other word that means spherical. I have yet to, to see the distinction... Uh, spelled out, but well, and, gotta... and and when I was reviewing the Kodak, the Kodak is 360 by 180. That's the field of view. So it was only a dome. It wasn't a sphere. And so that was very confusing oh. for a lot of people because you'd be shooting 360 degree. Oh, but you get a sky, but not ground, thing? and no ground. And so uh, yeah, yeah, that's 360, but. So actually, I think I think you're right though that if we were to start calling them spherical spherical cameras, that's maybe the best way to sort of it. It makes a sphere. That's Photosphere. probably yeah. the easiest way to explain. But moving right along, that's uh -huh. enough talking about Leica. I'm I'm stoked to check check out the P9. I, I, anything that that actually moves forward, image quality over just fun lifestyle features is is gonna have my attention. Um, <clears throat> speaking of having my attention, I've spent mm -hmm. this last week playing with the iPhone SE. 
a little mid-ranger phone. It's a mid-ranger phone. Mid-ranger. Mid-range. Mm-hmm. Not flagship. Yeah. Mid-ranger. I'm going to get so much hate for that. I love you it. You are. So, uh, but, but the iPhone SE is, uh, is already proving to be kind of an interesting beast because we can't really get a bead on how well it's selling. On PocketNow.com, we have written three stories, I think, about sales for the iPhone SE. And one of them was, iPhone SE sales are terrible. And then the last one was, iPhone SE is backordered because it's selling way faster than Apple anticipated. So I don't know, Stephen, what do you, what do you think? I mean, how do we classify... Yeah, we're looking at so many different level. metrics here. iOS product, though. Oh, sorry, what's that? How do we classify... No, like, how, do, how do we classify what, what is success on an entry-level an entry level iOS product? There's no expectation. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Things. This is unprecedented. Having Apple uh, replace a device in its lineup that was its... You, you could argue that it was the, the lower-end phone. It was... You know, instead of having a, a purpose-built lower-end model like the 5C, Apple lets its older flagships hang around for a little while. So the 5S, it offered users an affordable phone and a smaller phone. The SE is taking those two things and also adding the modern guts to it. And this is why it's not uh, a mid-ranger. So I disagree with your assessment there. It's got <laughs> these flagship silicon internals in there. Uh, and as a result, we, we don't really know what portion of the market it's supposed to draw from. Is this taking users who may have wanted the success originally and just didn't want a big phone? Is this taking users who would have been getting the uh, the 5S before and just want the cheapest phone regardless of, of what uh, hardware it gives you there? Um, and then looking at how these numbers come by us, like some of them are ad stuff, looking at um, just getting a sense of the overall picture of what iPhones are in use right now and seeing, well, okay, the SE is making up 0.1% of all iPhones uh, currently online at this moment that are viewing our, uh, you know, our content delivery network. Uh, and compared to some past launches, looking at like the first week that very like the old flagships were around, they pick up a lot more uh, use really early on, which I don't think is surprising because people have been waiting all year to get the new iPhone. Uh, you know, they're lining up. They have their orders in. Everyone likes to get these things right out of the gate. The SE both by nature of not being a direct replacement for the the success and the success plus because it's launching in the spring rather than the fall when everyone has their contracts lined up to get the new iPhone there's not going to be that initial demand necessarily so strong that still doesn't mean that people aren't going to be upgrading to it and right. maybe Apple took this in mind when getting its stocks in line so yeah if stores are selling out it might be because Apple didn't assume that everyone would be rushing out to get this thing. It might be, you know, rather than trying to get a really strong set of orders uh, fulfilled right out of the gate, Apple might instead be anticipating, well, maybe for the next few months, there's going to kind of be a, a steady demand, maybe even sort of peaking as we get into later summer when users had been, you know, thinking about upgrading to their, you know, new fall flagship. Well, maybe now we're going to think about the SE again because that's a really, really compelling value, especially if you don't need a larger device. So, yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at these uh, figures, and I don't think without you know being privy to Apple's internal estimates that it's safe to say whether or not this thing is a success or not. Yeah, I, it's it's really fascinating business territory because I think the SE, with Apple saying they sold 30 million iPhone 5s over 2015, we have a rough ballpark that that's somewhere around or a little less than 10% of their overall sales. If I'm doing the math on uh, smartphone shipments over 2015 versus Apple's uh, position in the market, They're the percentage of Apple and iOS devices. And so the SE has, I don't think there are any expectations that this thing's going to do more or build radical new market penetration for Apple over what the 5S used to serve. It's just that you don't want to leave 10% of your potential sales on, on the table mm-hmm. uh, without some type of product to service that market. Um, the, I, 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 this is going to be a really interesting thing because Apple has no reputation for building specifically less expensive phones. It's always older devices that have fulfilled that demand in the past. And the 5C was an absolute mess. Because, I mean, this thing is already <laughs> doing better than the 5C. I was, I was, as I would hope. Oh, as, as we would all hope. I, I was doing a, a lot of work with uh, AT&T PR at the time that the 5C was launched. Mm-hmm. And these things were just sitting on store shelves, sitting in warehouses. You're the crickets. They could, they could not get rid of them. But I want to circle back real quick, because I think this is just a super fun debate. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Stephen, what makes a flagship phone in 2016? Didn't we talk about this last week? We did, but it's this is so much fun! Okay. So normally I'm going to look at pricing, and I would argue that the 
pricing for this, if you get you know the 64 gigabytes that you need, starts pushing into flagship territory. But more than that... Oh, but, but I mean, like, okay, so this is also one thing that I want to jump in, and I'm sorry, I'm going to let you finish your point. No, I'm no, going to no. let you finish your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but we also know that Apple sells a ton of 16 gigs, right? They wouldn't keep making the 16 gig phone if they weren't selling scores of sure. them. So you have to ignore, have an iPhone. We can't ignore that that lower, super cramped, ultra claustrophobic storage model doesn't exist. So I mean, like the argument that this thing starts at uh, at 399 with 16 gigabytes of storage. Mm-hmm. But that's two hundred and fifty dollars less than a sixteen gig iPhone six S, and the iPhone six S, I would imagine, the sixteen gig is probably their best seller. We we have to acknowledge that the starting price on this thing is three ninety nine. We can't just yeah. make that leap and say, well, the one that's worth it is the sixty four gig. Okay, okay, but and I'm going to kind of go circular logic here to you know fulfill my no, no, please, please continue conclusion I, I, here. Um, the iPhone six S clearly is the flagship model here. Uh, the pricing dicta- dictates this. It, it's place in Apple's lineup. We and so we establish this. We look at its internals. I'm gonna say that any phone that does those same things that the Success does is a flagship in its own right. You can make it bigger. You can make it smaller. You can make it more affordable. But because it it's still delivering the same, it, you're looking at the SOC. You're looking at okay. Yeah, we're not doing 3D touch, but I think that it hits the same button as someone looking for the performance of a top-of-the-line iPhone is going to get their money's worth here. And I, unless this would have, like, the rumors initially were suggesting this thing was going to be like a compromise between uh, it was going to look like the 5S, which it ultimately did, but the internals might be closer to the uh, iPhone 6 rather than the uh, 6S, maybe an A8 SoC. If it had an A8, I would be with you. It would be a mid-ranger. But because it has the A9... I've got to say, it's still in flagship territory. It's just so, a smaller one. So it's, for, it's, it's like a Z, it's like an Xperia Z5 compact. Okay, no, I'm glad, I'm glad you're bringing this up. I am because the Z, the Z5 compact, which is now discontinued. I mean, we got a lot of questions, and 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 had anyone Wait, on the it team discontinued? Did I what blink you, and miss this? No, the Z line is gone. Oh, oh yeah, I'm not making a new one. No, 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 no that's, that's what I mean. It's like oh, oh. Sony is ending the Xperia Z line, which is, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> It, it's more basically when we're looking at the Z5 Compact that you can still get at B and H. I mean, we're talking about a product line that's dying. I mean, that's an evolutionary mm-hmm. dead end as far as Sony's concerned. Um, but we did get a lot of questions about that, and really, unfortunately, it just came down to the fact that we couldn't do the comparison between the Z5 and the SE because we couldn't get them until months after they were released. And then when we did, it wasn't really the full Z experience, as it lacks the fingerprint sensor. <laughs> And it was already so far past the discussion point on that that we just never really picked up on one here at Pocket. Now, that's a little inside baseball for all you kids out there. But, so, the differences between a Z5 Compact and a Z5, I feel, are much smaller for that company, for Sony as a company, than the differences between an SE and a 6S. So, you mentioned 3D Touch, right? So 3D yeah. Touch is one thing that goes into a flagship. Which is a rubbish is gimmick feature. It totally is. And I think it's got terrible conveyance. But moving into the future, if Apple ever de- releases a phone without a home button, it's going to be accomplished by using force gestures on a screen. So that's future-facing. That's flagship. Flagships have future-facing technologies built into them. Maybe we don't always get the benefits of them today, but we, we want to see them pushing the boundaries on what a phone can do. Okay. Um, so, so what about better Wi-Fi performance? Do you care about better Wi-Fi performance? No. Of course you don't, because the SE doesn't have MIMO antennas that the, that the 6S introduced. So if you have a newer router, you have stronger Wi-Fi connectivity and faster data speeds thanks to multiple input, multiple output radios. Uh, what about LTE, LTE Advanced? Do you care about having faster data speeds to your carrier? Dude, I get eggs where I live. Come on. <laughs> so obviously you do not, because the iPhone SE does not have LTE Advanced. And because and, uh, I know you're always out there taking your, your rad little selfies, more so more. obviously the iPhone SE... Is the is the is a fine phone with its 1.2 megapixel, you know, selfie camera, so that's totally flagship grade. Also, so I mean, just everything about the SE is totally flagship, right? Not everything, <laughs> but it's in it's in the flagship spectrum. It's on the well, that's that's what I mean. Is so so like at some point we're really parsing, 
it's a little mid-pack priced entry-level iOS feature compromised flagship. Is it upper middle class or lower upper class? I don't know. You know, that, and that's just it. Is I mean, we can sit here and, and, and try and but but at some point we still do have to hold this. Uh, like, there's an entry level tier, a mid range tier, and a flagship tier. And Apple has two phones in the flagship tier. They have no entry level no. tier for the for the market as a whole. And then there's this product, the iPhone SE. So just like you can get like a One Plus or a, a Moto X Pure or um, e- even a Nexus device, which features some pretty killer flagship specs, those phones don't directly compete against Note fives or Galaxy S7 edges or even LG G fives to some degree. Don't, We're don't compete about in the market, or don't compete as devices. Well, there's a reason why we step up. I mean, if you step up to a Galaxy S7, you expect a certain build quality. You expect a certain uh, a level of design, that the design is fresh, that it feels new. There, there are certain lifestyle features that benefit from having spent more on that product. And then Apple also builds a huge part of their reputation on things like support and uh, accessibility, like being able to go to Apple stores and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, so when all of that's factored into the price, Apple is using the iPhone SE with a hardware design that is nearing that is starting its fourth year of service. This is not a new hardware design. This doesn't push the boundaries of aesthetics. It doesn't push the boundaries of technology because it's a lot of it's a rollback to the, either the iPhone 6 or the iPhone 5S. And the one the, the two areas, I'll, I'll I'll give you two areas where the SE properly competes against flagship phones and that's processor and that's headphone jack. The headphone audio <laughs> output is phenomenal. I, I mean, like, all joking aside, the headphone audio output on the SE is phenomenal. There is like no Like, significantly phone. better than other smartphones? There is no phone at a $400 price point I can find that truly um, can unseat the iPhone SE. You're going to really? trade a lot of back and forths. But huh. it's a super high-quality amp. It's one of the loudest, punchiest uh, smartphones you can get. It's got a great EQ curve. And the one the one failing on an Apple device is they don't properly support um, high bit rate uh, lossless audio files. So they downsample them. You can still play them, but they will be downsampled. Wait. You don't get the full 24-bit 96 or 192K oh. um, audio experience if you're listening on super great audio files with great headphones. Um, but those are the two areas. So I don't feel that makes for a flagship phone. I think that makes for an upper mid-range premium small form factor entry level iOS device. But I can't call that a flagship. You know, speaking of the issues you take with the you know, years old design, did you see that mod I just posted earlier today? I did, where you can make it look like an uh, like a six. That's yeah, exactly there's these cool. uh, these companies selling uh, shells, like the original design for the iPhone 5s that that ape the look of the 6 and the uh, the 6S with those curved around the, the edge sides there. And you can take the guts out of the phone. It worked with the 5S. It'll work with the SE, as, as these uh, these guys trying this found out. It's a pain in the ass to do. This is going to take you the better part of all day. And you'll probably end up with a broken phone. <laughs> probably. No warranty, because you brought this on yourself. <laughs> Even if you do get it done, it's still not great, because, like, uh, the ports are like a little deeper than they would be normally, and it doesn't look nearly as nice as a you know Apple made from the ground up thing does. But when you finish it and you put it next to a 6S and a 6S Plus, it looks like you have like a trio, a nice family of Apple devices, yeah. all designed at the same time, all with comparable performance, and it'd be a nice reality to live in. I just like to imagine this is what the a- actual Apple lineup is right now. Well, and, and I also wonder, like, if this means that when the iPhone 7 comes out, that the, the iPhone SE 2 will be an iPhone 6 <laughs> with six-month-old um, be- better top-of-the-line specs. But uh, moving from a company that's doing phenomenally well on the market to a company mm-hmm. that's struggling a little bit, um, the, uh, the reports of BlackBerry's death keep getting uh, more and more aggressive as we look at what the future of this company might look at, the end of BlackBerry OS the beginning of BlackBerry Android devices, and the, the the pretty long lead time we've seen in support for BlackBerry products with uh, Marshmallow updates. Yeah, uh, things have not been... Well, they haven't been looking good for BlackBerry for a while now. We got this you know kind of breath of fresh air last year with the Priv. Maybe this is going to open some new doors for BlackBerry, and 
It did, and I think the Priv was a, a surprising, a pleasantly surprising phone for a lot of users when they finally got a chance to try it out. But it just did a few things wrong. It wasn't available in as many carriers as we wanted initially, and it just cost too damn much. Uh, I think a lot of people would have given the phone a try had it been a little more accessible. And BlackBerry, I don't know if it's just wanting to you know, make a, as much money as they could on the phone or just the sense of hubris and that, you know, we're BlackBerry, we're making enterprise-grade phones like no one else is doing. There's no other QWERTY hardware <laughs> keyboard Android device like this out here. People, there's a certain contingent who wants a phone like this and will pay whatever we say to get it. And... They, they said you had to pay a lot. I mean, this thing started selling $700, and, it, well, I guess it didn't start selling was the problem. People just hadn't yeah. been buying this thing like they needed to. So BlackBerry's finally lowering the price, but only by 50 bucks. Uh, so if you got 650 laying around, you can still pick up a Priv. I wouldn't recommend it, not at this price. When you start getting down into, it's like, tough. The 550 range? This is a much, much more interesting. Yeah, there you go with those price projections. I love it. Well, yeah. no, I mean, actually, on this one, I'm, I'm going to agree. I, I, so I've got my Priv right over here. This is such a cool phone. It mm -hmm. really is. I love this keyboard. I love this slider action. This is the best camera that we've ever seen on a BlackBerry device, and it's just below that tier of just the top performers from Samsung and uh, LG and Apple and Microsoft. I mean, it's it's just on all counts. This is this is a very good phone, and it's got, of course, I mean, no phone's perfect. It has its share of issues, but um, Apple's position. Uh, Apple, sorry. <laughs> uh, the cold medicine's kicking in. Uh, BlackBerry's position Ooh. in the market is really tenuous. I think BlackBerry stands as this great example of the fallacy of build an Android device that'll sell better because Android has the bigger market share. Mm -hmm. um, BlackBerry doesn't understand the Android market. They don't understand the, the, uh, the importance that we place on specs to pricing. They don't understand the competition coming from, uh, you know, uh, Google at, with their Nexus program trying to be a price disruptor to Chinese companies to the top tier flagship phone makers like Samsung. Um, this is not a market they're familiar with at all. So I mean, especially when you're talking about, it totally does look like hubris and ignorance when BlackBerry walks into this market with this phone at $700. Like, what are they thinking? They don't get it. And I know that part of that pricing is probably placed on the infrastructure surrounding BlackBerry devices, sure. the security settings on BlackBerry devices. There's probably a legitimate reason why that phone cost as much as it did. But then we have to start asking, well, were there any other compromises you could have made so that you didn't walk into a super competitive Android uh, environment with a device from a company that people haven't interacted with in a long time. Consumers don't have a relationship with the BlackBerry brand anymore. I think one thing that BlackBerry could have done would have been a really smart move here, and it still may. We certainly heard rumors about something like this earlier. Uh, I don't know if it's still the direction the company is heading, but releasing a, a second Android-powered device as soon as possible. I think the spring really needs to have a, a second uh, Android BlackBerry Oh, yeah. and, and especially a more affordable one. If they could give us something that maybe was a less elaborate device, so it didn't have the sliding mechanic of the Priv, I don't know if it would have to have a QWERTY keyboard or not, but even just something like the, a Passport, but an Android running device, just to show that, well, one, we're committed to this. This wasn't just a one month. I know we've heard the company talking about we're going to do more Androids, but put up or shut up and show uh, smartphone shoppers that you are going to keep on developing for... Android, that this is a, a this Android BlackBerry crossover idea is something that users can bank on, and we'll be able to you know, keep getting hardware coming down the line here. Totally. That was super important. There's no trust. Uh, yeah, if they could make this more affordable, also giving uh, saying, okay, well, this Priv looks very nice, like what you did here. I'm not paying seven hundred dollars for it, but if you can do something in this like five to six hundred range, well, then maybe I'll see what you have to offer here. And by not doing this, the company's missing out on a big opportunity. Oh, absolutely, and and it's something that I've I've gotten cranky about before, you know, even before I came to Pocket. Now, is uh, it's the same problem facing Microsoft. It's the same problem facing anyone who's walking into this market right now. You need at least three years of regular updates, consistency of design, of distribution, of of support, of showing customers that you will be there. Phones yeah. are mission critical. We're not going to take a risk on a company 
hopefully living up to the promises they, that they made on a first generation device. And your point about building a, a, a less... Uh, a less complicated phone, or I, I forget exactly what you said because the cold medicine is kicking in. Mm -hmm. um, your, your point, though, like if we were to get a BlackBerry Classic running Android yeah. as a follow-up device and you can hit that that sub-iPhone SE mid-range price point, <laughs> um, I think we could have something very interesting to show consumers BlackBerry's back. They're still applying pressure to this market. They're not walking away. They're not just going to leave you in the lurch. And that would be a second year of goodwill. So that then next year when we get into 2017 and we start talking about new BlackBerry flagships and new BlackBerry entry-level phones, mm -hmm. then customers have a history that they can look back to, that they're doing something interesting with Android. They're coming in at a variety of price points. If someone wants something nicer, they can get that. If so they want something cheaper, they can get that. And I think that makes that conversation so much easier. Right now they're doing this top-down approach, and no one's going to risk that much money on a device which might not get the support. They're you know, just certainly not showing that they're delivering on the support yet. I liked what you said a minute ago about you want to see a smartphone that's going to get three years of software support there. Because we've yeah. long had this idea of two years in our mind. I think because we a lot of us have been upgrading on two-year cycles. But you know we've expected manufacturers to be living, delivering firmware updates for two years. And some do better, some do worse. I think we should be expecting three years. I think you're onto yeah. something here. Uh, I, mean, because I was like, thinking earlier, like, like hardware... Bug. Stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I was I'm sorry. I was just saying, like, even if just the last year is bug fixes, yeah, security I mean, updates, stuff like that. Well, I definitely think we should be asking for that. But more so, I think phones have gotten to a place now where we're not seeing these great leaps forward in processing power. Yeah, there have been advancements in RAM, but I don't think that the operating systems are necessarily using all that they can there, such that there's no good reason why. You know, a phone that was a flagship three years ago that maybe had like a Snapdragon 800 and two gigs of RAM shouldn't be able to run like, the very latest versions of, of <laughs> your various platform releases here. Right. And I, I mean, yeah, there's the question of whether or not it's in these companies' interest to keep uh, developing software for devices that are no longer being bought, but there is no longer... In years past, there might have been a technological reason for why you didn't want to shoehorn a more modern OS into a 512 megabyte RAM phone or something, but it's getting harder and harder to defend that position. Yeah, the justification on that I, I find to be specious at best in this day and age. Uh, we, we look at the, the specs on, or the stats on Android adoption, and phones like the Galaxy S3 are still crazy popular around the world. And so we run into some huge issues in the Android ecosystem when those phones aren't getting support. It's like having a bunch of zombie Windows XP computers in the desktop space when we start talking about uh, security exploits like stage fright. Where do those people get support if we're not going to update those devices within the time frame that they're realistically mm -hmm. using those phones? And that's very disappointing to see happen to this market that it's so diverse, which is a great strength for Android, but it also seems to be Android's greatest weakness when it comes to the actual consumer experience. Sorry, I just had to swallow there. So um, I do have a quick question that, that seemed to get downvoted in the Q&A that I want to bring up real quick. <laughs> um, this is from Unicorn Workhorse. And uh, will BlackBerry ever drop the keyboard in order to compete with other manufacturers? Uh, I'm thinking the keyboard can be a tool that helps get their name out. And uh, BlackBerry has actually uh, dropped the keyboard on BlackBerry OS 10 phones. Um, yeah, so C10. They, was it was it the was the one Q10? I can't remember. The which Z was series, it. whatever the number was, was, was the their one very first Z phone didn't have a hardware keyboard, right? And I was going to say this idea of delivering a you know more hardware simple phone when it didn't have all these sliding mechanics, maybe one without a keyboard in general. The problem is I don't think that uh, answering this question as well, I don't think that consumers want this. The people who want BlackBerry are that interested in a, a no. Uh, keyboard phone. When it still ran BB10, maybe that was a little more compelling because you got a software experience that you couldn't get with Android. But if we're talking about an Android BlackBerry phone without a keyboard, honestly, what's the point? Yeah, I totally agree. So, uh, let's wrap up uh, devices, and uh, we've got a couple questions here in the Q&A about this, too. Uh, LG G5, there's been a lot of noise and <laughs> some gnashing of teeth regarding the build quality on this. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, so G5 positioned as LG's fancy new premium. What is it? It's a flagship phone. It's but their flagship phone. Premium metal. Um, I forget the actual words they used here. Talking about its anodized materials and 
aluminum unibody, and then people get their hands on the phone and they start uh, pawing at this thing, pawing at it with you know razor blades, as, as the case may be, and it's just sort of uh, it's chipping away, and uh, this you know it, this facade just sort of peels right off there. Uh, people were calling it plastic, calling it paint, and uh, it's uh, there's metal underneath there, but it, it you have to dig a little bit to get at it, and so you know, people are starting to get a little bit upset. Well, this isn't a capital M metal phone here. A lot of controversy, and LG finally uh, you know sticks up and says, no, 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 this it's it's a metal phone here. This is just like paint on the outside. We're protecting it, and there's a lot of good reasons why it would want to do that. Uh, with the LG G5, unlike many metal phones, you don't see antenna lines on the back, and mm -hmm. by having this non-conductive surface over the metal, that I'm sure helps them accomplish that. You know, I don't know if I buy this uh, uh, like an is a metaphor analogy that uh, LG uses here. <laughs> Talking about uh, cars, and you buy a car. You know your car is metal, but it still has paint on it, right? So yeah, not the right, not the right play there. No, because this is they're not selling it as a you know a, a painted phone or anything. This is like buying a DeLorean and finding out that it has silver paint on it. You buy the DeLorean because you want the <laughs> aluminum panels here. When you sell it as a metal car, you expect you know you touch it and oh I'm touching metal. That's not I, I'm kind of siding with the consumers on this one. No, I, I, I have to also. I, I really think this was a marketing misstep because I think if you had if you had just told us what the build quality of the G5 was supposed to be, that there was going to be a thick paint and that was their solution to hiding the You could, yeah, you could bands, spin this easily. Like tell us totally. why you're doing this. Call it like your super premium coated this is like the anti rust undercoating here make it make it seem pretty, <laughs> give us a reason to pay more for this thing. right well and, and then like uh, we got a high quality primer and it's going to yeah, make sure you know. that it survives those east coast winters with all of the salt on the roads salt um, fog no, I, I really i really feel like i i think consumers have every reason to feel a little disappointed in the expectation of what lg was delivering with their their marketing on this now Will that make this not a nice phone? I, I mean, Jaime is actually doing the main review on the G5, so we're going to hear from him, mm -hmm. and um, then uh, we're going to we're going to switch up a little bit so that he can spend some time with the iPhone SE, and I can do some of the camera stuff for the LG G5, and uh, you know we'll we'll be able to share some ideas back and forth and sh share some thoughts. I still think this is going to be a fine phone. Yeah, but like when you call it a metal phone, people are interested in that for three reasons: because this is a phone that's going to be strong but thin. Uh, this is a phone that's going to look shiny and pretty, and this is a phone that uh, some people just like the feel of this, you know, cool, smooth Absolutely. metal to the touch. And LG may be hitting one of those points, but by missing out on the other two, I think it's doing shoppers a disservice. Well, and also it's just the discovery. So we find out about this from bloggers, yeah, and no one's like surprises. That's not the right way for consumers to find out about that as a potential issue. Now the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and it wasn't actually in either of our stories um, hmm. on the LG G5 though, was, was this notion of the battery door potentially introducing um, compression problems on the bottom edge of the phone. And so we've seen from reviewers like uh, like Erica Griffin. She she did I think she, I think she's done like 17 videos on the oh LG G5 build quality at this point. Yeah, I've heard some reports like it didn't quite meet flush at the bottom there. It right. didn't look super premium. What's this compression issue you're talking about? And so at the at the bottom edge of the phone, what we're seeing is because of the way that we're adding uh, plastic um, or paint. I'm sorry, the way that we're adding paint that as you're sliding the battery into the bottom of the phone that it's actually pressing up against some of that material which compresses it and you create an, an extra seam and it does, oh. it, it looks like it starts to create a little bit of a buckle. This yeah. is actually Erica Griffin's video right here that we're taking a look at. And unfortunately, because of Google Hangouts not providing us the best image quality, um, on this bottom edge right here, um, on her unit, on her very first unit, she was talking about being able to see it almost looked like a little bit of buckling as that paint starts getting compressed by the mm -hmm. bottom edge of the, uh, the the battery tray. You know, I was just thinking to what you said a moment ago about how this would be a lot better if LG just took the time to explain to us exactly what it made the phone out of here, what decisions it did. And I'm tr trying to think of uh, examples of manufacturers who did a really excellent job at doing this. And I mean, it just came to me, the G4. We had all those videos of like, 
you're spending a month to make this leather back right. and all stitched very nicely. And they were really proud about that. And if we just saw that same sort of enthusiasm for this design, even with the metal underneath, and we have this, I'm sure, very fancy coating on top, but if they would have sold that to us, we would have a much different response. Well, and isn't that the the main problem that we've been talking about with LG for a while? They didn't sell it to us. Mm -hmm. They, it feels like they tried to hide it from us, which is the bad play. We don't like that. Yeah, that's uh, it's always going to make us super cranky when we when we discover that. So, um, moving out of smartphones and devices, we actually have a, we actually have quite a bit of carrier news to get to. But before we get to that, I wanna um, I wanna touch on sort of Android market, Windows Phone share a little uh, industry and uh, industry business news right there because apparently yeah, it ties into guess what we were saying about those uh, Android uh, or people running old versions of, of Android and leaving themselves absolutely. vulnerable. Absolutely, Stephen, give us the four one one. What's going on with this market? Yeah, uh, we're looking at the latest breakdown of you know who's on what versions of their various software. Uh, Google's got its latest monthly Android figures out there. Marshmallow is showing some nice gains. I mean, it's unfortunate it took this many months after it was <laughs> to start showing up on as many devices, but as new phones uh, get into the hands of more and more customers, as we start to see upgrades hitting uh, existing phones, it's living at like 4% now, uh, 4.6. It's almost at 5. Uh, unfortunately, though, you look at that you know pie chart there, there's still this huge Kit Kat slice of it. Lollipop is dominating, but KitKat is it's big enough to be worrisome because these are users who are exposed to all sorts yeah. of issues now. Stage fright exploits out in the wild. Uh, it, it's dangerous, man. Stop using these old phones here. Uh, oh. You are you're putting yourself at risk. Your data is at risk. Uh, you got to trade off, man. Well, and I, I mean, like, I, I, I completely agree. It's just, you know, it never proves to be that simple when we're talking about world markets. You know, someone might be investing in a phone as their primary computing device, and that thing needs to last, you know, especially as we're talking about emerging markets and, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of new wave of consumers who are more at entry-level devices. That might be all they have access to in some areas of the world. Because all thinking. the more reason, though, to not be using a vulnerable device then. Well, but then also, I mean, as, as we're talking about emerging markets, we're also talking about emerging education, that these people don't know what they're fully in store for when they go and see an ultra-cheap Galaxy S3 that can tackle most or <coughs> almost all of their computing needs. Are they going to be aware that, oh, and by the way, this is a super compromised version of Android that you're going to be using? It's, it's a really difficult situation and, and one where I find it particularly upsetting that Google can't get after older phones with the ability to do something like a flash a version of Android 1 on them. So that yeah, they say, Android 1 is definitely you know, Google's uh, aim at correcting this issue and giving uh, shoppers in these markets access to phones that will have uh, you know, state the, the latest security updates available as they come out. Uh, the problem, though, I think it's focusing more on selling these new devices than making the same software available to old ones. I mean, that would be yeah. a big undertaking, uh, getting manufacturers to do this, because Android One isn't uh, just based on software. It's based on, oh, initially, it was very strict hardware. Uh, you had to only work with certain components that's loosened up more recently. But the more hardware you have involved, the more options and trickier this is. And so that may be easier said than done. Oh, no, it, it absolutely is. But yeah. I also think that it, this it is... It would be a nice thing, yeah. It would be super nice. And I think this is a major issue that we face when we look at the Android ecosystem. Again, when I say Android's biggest asset is its diversity, but that's also its biggest weakness. Um, now, alongside this, we also got some, some kind of interesting news that while we saw those Android numbers growing... We uh, a good chunk of those seem to be coming from former Windows Phone fans. I would understand if they're starting to feel a little fed up here. Uh, I'd be curious to get some more detailed information on exactly where these. So we're looking at some uh, global figures of uh, trends in users switching or the market share over time. We're seeing Android's numbers going up. Windows phones are kind of dwindling. Is the question: uh, Are these people who are on Windows Phone kind of getting fed up with the platform? Were they holding out for their Windows 10 mobile updates? And then they realized maybe they you know they had those insider previews. Oh, this is finally going to get the official update, and then Microsoft freezes them out <laughs> as it did. Uh, they're getting fed up and switching over. Maybe they're just actually seeing something appealing in Android that they haven't uh, been able to get from Microsoft and, and Windows 10. Uh, but for whatever reason, they're you know, or just the lack of new devices is is a yeah. good enough reason to uh, start looking over the Android side of the fence there. Um, but yeah, we're seeing Windows Phone users just aren't. Uh, 
sticking with it for the long haul here. Well, I'm going to use Microsoft as another piece of evidence to support my hypothesis that three years of consistent application in a market can make you a more successful company. Because every single time Microsoft had built a little momentum in the, uh, in the smartphone market, we would get something that would just completely kill it, like going from Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 8. None of you Windows Phone 7 users get Windows Phone 8. Too bad, so sad. So that was a hard roadblock. Then, going from Windows Phone 8, the flagships that actually did build, I mean, the Lumia 930, the Lumia 1520 built some cred. I saw tons of Lumia 1520s for a hot minute out here in California. It was an audacious phone. And then it took us two years, over two years, <laughs> to get another flagship. And you're like, no one's going to stick around for that. So I can totally appreciate and I totally understand why. I've got a Lumia 950 over on the side, which I'm still, I boot up every day just to kind of see what updates and what apps are sort of available. And it's, it's almost always a disappointing experience. I still don't have the camera update that we talked about two weeks ago, <laughs> which was supposed to fix the HDR toggling and... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No Hold your breath for that. N none of that. None. No. Nerp. Uh-uh. Nada. Boo. So, um, yeah, I, I, I know, uh, you know, I think Microsoft is, is sort of now probably going to slow play this and come around as a, as a sort of a, an app first solution to try and get universal apps on Windows computers. And then it'll make more sense to focus back in on phones again. But that means that we're probably going to be in another holding pattern while we wait for them to update phone software and come out with new phone devices. And I think that's a terrible position to be in when we see Apple and uh, Google working as hard as they are to, uh, to fight each other. Microsoft could come in as a disruptor, but instead they're slow playing this, and I think that's going to kill it. I, th I think you agree with me on that one, Stephen. I, 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 am, I am, I'm not very optimistic for Microsoft's <laughs> shot at long-term success in the smartphone market here, don't uh... Yeah, I, I think I think we're 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 probably on opposite sides. I'm very hopeful for a company to come in and act as a disruptor, but every time uh, Microsoft gets close to that, they end up breaking my heart a little bit more. So, you think they would have learned by now? No, I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm gonna keep coming <laughs> back. I you know it as long as I keep seeing Zeiss branded optics and pure view mm -hmm. cameras and all of those fun features that I actually do enjoy. I'm gonna keep checking them out, but man, it's tough out there for a Windows Phone fan. No oh, good. So um, I want to blitz through this. Uh, we do have just a, a short list of just carrier updates, carrier news, 18 Yeah, apologies to our non-US listeners here. I'm sure you're going to be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so we don't have to spend a lot of times on these, but it, it was sort of rare that over the last couple days we got fairly large announcements from all four major carriers. So I just kind of want to hit them real quick. Really, we'll none of these are big today. announcements. This is all... <laughs> well, I mean, none of them are huge, but that, like, we actually have legitimate news Fair from enough. all four carriers over the last couple of days, not just, like, AT&T is lighting up DSL in Poughkeepsie. Yeah. You know, like, that's, <laughs> that, that's not, like, what we're talking about. We actually have... It's yeah, news. Okay. It's real news. It's just we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. So, um, starting us off on not spending a lot of time on this, as I've already spent way too much time on the explaining, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, is uh, at and and Verizon, they're looking at uh, bumping up your prices. Charging you more money. Why? Because they can. at and fees when you upgrade. Verizon, well, they're already char charging more if you still had some limited data plans back uh, in the last year. If it didn't get you then, it's charging you more now. Yep. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to quit carriers? Are you going to switch? Nah, you're not going to. You're going to stick with it. You're going to pay more money. <laughs> and again, we're, we're spiky and we're sarcastic and we're satirical and sardonic because we care. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know. Where did Sprint go so wrong? Uh, Sprint, is, it had some kind of uh, not great news. Uh, it's Sprint is basically going to the, the uh, pawn store here. I it's, love that uh, they're trying to spin this as a positive move for the no, company. It's like, I absolutely oh, Sprint, adore. Oh, fundraising. We made a lot of money here. No, you Little didn't. Yellow you is didn't. trying to fight so hard. It, it sold its house, and now it's trying to rent it back from the new owner here. This is not. This is what Nokia did with its uh with its headquarters when it was <laughs> looking to get some cash. This is not a sign of a business on in great shape. Now we're talking about it's selling uh, network resources here. Uh, I don't think it's still exactly what the assets are, but uh, some pricey ones, three billion dollars worth. That could be towers. That could be rights to Spectrum. Uh, in any case, it has offloaded those, and it's going to. It's still going to get them back. It's leasing them, so. 
uh, the quality of the network shouldn't degrade for the users, but Sprint has just delayed the inevitable here. Yeah, and and the one the one move that is kind of interesting is the fact that they're talking about using this money to then beef up their infrastructure on new LTE bands, but this is an infrastructure that they're selling off to another company and then leasing back. I mean, this is this is down the rabbit hole kind of business shenanigans. Yeah. It looks cool for one fiscal quarter. But long term, I can't see how this is gonna this is gonna pay off well for Sprint. Well, you get the this quarter looking good, the investors are happy. Then you get the golden parachute. Then it's the next CEO's problem to worry about. <laughs> and like Kyle Ruggles just popped in with bring Fi to newer phones, and I have to wonder is is this a situation where SoftBank might be looking at what assets they have in Sprint, and then maybe trying to eventually sell Sprint off to someone unrelated oh. to the. Uh, that, or at least just the Sprint brand, someone unrelated to the uh, to the cell phone industry, like kind of a reverse direct TV AT and T merger. That's an interesting theory. So I, we'll we'll have to see how this play this plays out, but uh, confidence is not super high for Sprint strategy right now, and that's kind of a bummer because I started out on Sprint. I was a I was on a Cero plan. They probably didn't like that I was on an employee refer- referral plan. I've never had a Sprint device. But they were awesome, and, and you know, like when we first started playing with 4G networks and WiMAX <laughs> and all that stuff, it was it was cool. And then the market moved on, and everything sucked. Oh. Um, but yeah, there was a while there. Sprint was For that hot Sprint. minute, and especially because you didn't want to be you want to be on AT and T. You were cooler than that. It was exclusive. <laughs> Evo 4G LT WiMAX. <laughs> And, and lastly, this one I actually I just think is cool because I'm an audio nut, and I think this is something that as we move into the future of communications is T-Mo, uh, T-Mobile, sorry, I always abbreviate T-Mo. T-Mobile is looking to, uh, to improve the quality of our voice calls above just regular VO over LTE. Yeah, it started deploying, or it's about to, no, it just started deploying this thing called EVS, Enhanced Voice Services, which is kind of a nebulous collection of uh, various technologies here. Uh, we're not sure exactly uh, what on a very uh, you know detailed network level is going on here, but the the end result for you, the user, should be higher quality sound here, uh, expanded frequency range. I don't know if we're talking about more bandwidth for the data, so it'll be less compressed or not, but uh, better quality calls when you make voice calls. Uh, also, a more robust network. It should be more resistant to drop-offs in uh, low signal areas, as well as the ability to use EVS over both LTE connections as well as Wi-Fi, if your phone supports mm-hmm. uh, Wi-Fi calling there. Uh, only real issue here is that it's not ha- it doesn't have really broad hardware support just yet. The only phone uh, currently available with EVS is the, uh, the new LG G5. Uh, T-Mobile said that the Galaxy S7 and the 7 Edge are getting an update this week. So it might even be out today. I haven't checked yet. Uh, upgrading them to support this. And then throughout the year, there'll be like seven new phones that have this. I don't know if that means uh, phones that will be launching with this built in or upgrades coming to existing models, but there's not a lot of uh, phones that can use this. And presumably, I know, like it's like with uh, VOLTE, to get the full advantage of it, you have to have this on you know both ends. Uh, yeah. So it might be a while before we see the real impact of this, but it's a step in the right direction. And voice calls have always been like the redheaded stepchild of modern day <laughs> communication networks here. Uh, and for good reason, because you know we don't use them that much, and voice support is already built into so many apps. Who really needs a you know using their phone's regular dialer for calls? But if you still do, this is you know advancements it's, coming, good stuff. It's it's so funny that like in in just what different spectrums of geeks that we are, that when you saw a uh, broader frequency range, that you were thinking about like network infrastructure and data compression. And I, you know, I'm I'm looking at my collection of microphones, going, well, I wonder what parts of the EQ range, like, is it going to be like mid range or the bass frequencies? Okay, so normal voice phone, it's limited to what, like a four kilohertz cutoff on the the standard phone line. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually pretty low. Yeah, I don't know what the so T-Mobile has HD voice, which predates Mm -hmm. VOLTE, and I, I was trying to get info on this and running this up. I couldn't find exactly what the benefit of HD, like exactly what frequency range we're talking about, what compression it uses. I would love to see that. I'd love to see the data on what EVS does to exchange that. T-Mobile, if you want to release that, please shoot me a, a message there. I'd love to see that. Well, and, and also, I mean, especially having done work on, uh, there, there are these old recording systems uh, that we used to use called ISDN. Um, which <laughs> Recording? 
Well, I mean, ISDN was a data infrastructure, but yeah. there are still there's just this huge infrastructure of ISDN for real time communication for recording studios, radio stations, stuff like that. So when someone's doing so a low, low band rate, but it's it's funny is that it's it's actually still one of the best solutions for um, uh, preventing a huge disparity. So like with internet, you know, you have dropped packets. Mm. You can have these buffer ranges where it starts to really slow down the or increase the amount of time between um, sending a signal and receiving the signal. And with ISDN, you rarely run into a, a, a lot of lag. It's like a digital version of an old leased line, basically. Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, it absolutely is. And it's just two phone lines, and you plug these two phone lines in together, and that's how you get sort of your input. 128 kilobits. <laughs> and that you're reducing this to, like, some ridiculous, like, uh, you know, some sessions are even done at, like, a 64, gig, uh, 64 kilobit. Right, single uh, link is 64. AAC. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 64 kilobits. So that's that's still what we're using. You know, uh, we haven't found as robust a solution in the recording space, and internet solutions are only just now starting to pop up mm -hmm. that can handle that kind of infrastructure at the same recording quality with uh, without any buffers or stutters or or lag. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, that that's why I mean, when I start seeing like even wireless carriers are starting to talk about higher quality voice calls, higher quality audio, I'd love to see the stats on that. Because if we can start building some of that stuff into wireline solutions, the entire infrastructure for things like ISDN just evaporates overnight. <laughs> we could get that same... If we could get a high-quality voice send and receive and then plug it into directly into an Ethernet cable, that would eliminate a ton of these. And they're, they're really expensive solutions. ISDN is really expensive to yeah. and to maintenance. Uh, a lot of phone carriers in a lot of places around the world will ignore it and just forget that they can do that because they want to move everything over to digital. So this could be a, a really huge step for the market. And it's funny that it's coming you know, just from like a little T-Mobile press release, but it's all the behind-the-scenes stuff that's actually kind of interesting. Okay, my, my voice is, is right on the edge. Yeah. Um, I mean, you held out. We only got uh, a few more messages to go here. So <laughs> I had, and again, because they keep moving around. Um, I, I do have, uh, so we have viewer viewer questions and yeah. uh, for the email. And then also I want to tackle just a couple of these Q&As. Yeah. Real quick. So we've got Patstar5. And uh, Steven, on the spot, what do you think happens when Apple gets rid of the headphone jack? And I think he's talking about the rumors that the iPhone 7 will get rid of the headphone jack. Go. Uh, are we doing what these do in the room? Hold on. You think calamity in the streets, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria? Um, what will happen? I think Apple users will protest really strongly and then use whatever expensive adapter Apple releases on their old headphones. They will buy the new Beats audio with the built-in lightning connector. Um, it will not make a huge difference because the majority of headphone users out there will keep on using analog headphones on Android or whatever their other devices are. Uh, it's not going to shake up the market that much, I don't think. I agree. I don't, I don't think it's going to make a, a huge dent. And I also have to believe that there are going to be adapters. So your regular 3.5 millimeter headphones are probably going to connect into just some little dongle that then connects to your iPhone, and it could even be better. Right, people so. break their headphones all the time, and the yeah. idea that you can get, you know, not great, but decent headphones for like, you know, 10, 20 bucks, ones that mm -hmm. not, maybe not decent even, but... Actually, I no, I, there there are some great, I mean, I've got them sitting right here. These are, um, the, you know, here's, here's a little product mm -hmm. plug for you oh, guys. Yeah. They haven't oh, paid us for this. Um, these are the KZ8s, and they're monitor-style um, earbuds, inner inner oral biggins, headphones, yeah. huge drivers. I mean, these things. The, I think the base is a little floppy. Other people say that you know. It's what do those run you? Using them. Fifteen bucks. Yeah. So if something happens Ten to these, you, you snag them on a you know car door or something. You, you just lose them. It, it's not a big deal. Lightning based headphones will be more expensive. I don't think there's any way around that. And this idea of having something that you can basically treat as disposable, uh, yeah. it might go away for. Uh, Apple headphone users, and so maybe they'll have like the adapter that they want to keep safe, and then they'll still want to go with the cheaper headphones. I don't think you can replace that market, though. That these really affordable lightning-driven headphones aren't going to emerge, not overnight, maybe not for a while. Well, and and for those of us that that care about the amps and the DACs built into our phones, we're looking at devices like the LG G5, which has 
an interesting, if maybe a little potentially cumbersome solution in replacing the bottom edge of the phone to give you a higher quality DAC. If you could do an external DAC built on the Lightning connector, just as a, like a little uh, a little add-on with a 3.5 millimeter adapter, yeah, like a case be... or something that has that built in. Totally, and, and so that could actually be an even easier solution to get an, a higher quality sound out of your iPhone than what's already built into our current iPhone SEs and iPhone successes. So I, I think there's every potential for this to actually be a pretty cool consumer solution moving forward. I think the transition is going to be a little sticky just because 3.5 millimeter jacks have been around for a century. Um, but once we kind of get over that, that initial that they? bump... I, no, I'm no. exaggerating, but no, they ain't, no. But you know, tip ring sleeve connectors okay. have been around for a really long time. Um, but that's that's really all we're fighting is just the momentum of an old solution for this. I have one other Q and A here before we move on to the viewer emails from Ganzi Tech Nerd. And uh, do you think HTC's boast with hashtag Power of Ten camera will help them get back into the game? What do you think, Stephen? I mean, the boast alone isn't going to cut it. HTC's been nothing but hyperbolic with its <laughs> advertisements for the 10 here. Oh, it's going to have the best camera ever. Take the best video. It's going to be the best sounding phone you ever heard. It's really easy to promise these very objective things here. <laughs> uh, is it actually going to deliver on them? It might do very well in some, uh, some better than others. And uh, from the teaser we saw mentioned uh, optical image stabilization, 4K video, yeah, we would expect these things. Um, but I think the proof is going to be on the pudding here. And the fact that this sensor supposedly is one we've seen before, is maybe not doing things as, as unique as past UltraPixel devices have, might mean that it falls a little short of these really, really high expectations. HTC is, I think, overselling it might be the problem here. I'm sure it'll do very, very well. Like the 6P had a fantastic camera on it. If that's what ends up in the, the 10 here, as we think it will, then the phone's in good shape. But I don't know. They're promising so big. Yeah, and, and again, it's all about setting the right expectations. We had this issue with LG, that they set an expectation for an aluminum phone, and look at how that blew up in their face. And so even if HTC is, is in a really difficult position right now when it comes to things like cameras, because their cameras for the last couple phones have been not as nice as some of their competitors. I actually won't say that HTC has ever put out a bad camera. I think they've generally put out good cameras, but their good cameras are going up against excellent com cameras from competitors. And so even if HTC's camera solution is totally commiserate, is right on the rails, fights feature for feature with the Galaxy S7, you still need to undo all of that consumer knowledge, all of that common knowledge that HTC cameras suck. And so one one camera phone, I mean one phone with a with a good camera isn't going to undo all of that. And I bet there are still going to be a number of people out there just from their perception, just from again, their their we all have our own individual personal biases who even if that camera is spot on a direct competitor for a Galaxy S7 or an iPhone 6S or an LG G5, that they're still not going to feel like it's as nice a camera. You know, it, it's when they're the same there's nothing to talk about. HTC needs <laughs> to have a camera that's far that's better. better. Yeah, 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 has a hook. But there's no question that their camera has improved, and I don't know that they can do that. I don't know that any manufacturer can do that. Well, we'll find out what, Tuesday. Yeah, it's coming up quick. I'm going to be really mm -hmm. curious to see how they present that because I think Samsung's unpacked event set, <coughs> excuse me, set a more modest tone for bold um, claims. You know, the, the for the Galaxy S7 and the S7 Edge. Yeah, they didn't need to be overly braggadocious there. The oh. S7 is cameras delivered. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, HTC sort of slow played the A9 in, in the most underwhelming way possible, and now it seems like they're trying to make up for that with the HTC 10, but they're walking into a market where even Samsung recognizes, hey, we don't we don't need to... We don't really need to try and impress you. These things are what you asked for, and we're just going to give you that. HTC seems to be trying to impress us, and that, that always looks either cool or desperate, depending on who you ask. Okay, so I have limited shelf life left to finish mm. that. Let's get to the... Well, that's good, because we pretty much answered this first listener mail. Listener mail. Exactly. 
So the first listener mail, and I didn't, I, 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 again, cold medicine, I apologize. So this came courtesy of, uh, of Adam Wright, and he was asking about the headphone jack on the iPhone 7, um, that the leak's showing, that, that maybe there are rumors. And that is one point that I think is kind of interesting, is there's every possibility, I don't think it's likely, but I think there's every possibility that these leaks and rumors just aren't even true, that maybe the iPhone 7 still will have uh, a headphone jack. Yeah, this has mostly been a you know, analyst um, industry supply chain driven set of rumors, uh, and as such, there's the possibility that these are wrong, that we may be looking at something further down the line here. And Adam was specifically asking about the fact that we haven't seen this move already. You know, we yeah. just got the SE, we just got the uh, the new iPad Pro. Why, if Apple is going to do this, if already made up its mind, why didn't it make this change to lighting different audio with these devices? And I think there's something to be said for the fact the iPhone 7 is going to be it, it's we're moving up to a new number here. It's not the S. It's not an iterative model. We already have. I mean, the SE builds off existing hardware. The new iPad Pro. It's just a smaller version of the old one. Uh, moving to the iPhone 7 is going to be an opportunity for Apple to introduce new hardware, and it more than that, it needs to have new hardware to make the phone really stand out. So it makes sense for the company to hold back a big shift like this for that that flagship phone. Uh, so if it is going to do it, I don't think the fact that we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean that it won't. There were a lot of qualifiers in that set. That's what my point holds. <laughs> but I think I think I think we all know what you mean, Stephen. And mm. uh, it, again, it's it's always one of the dangers of relying too heavily on leaks on uh, some of this uh, industry. You know, like when we start seeing dummy units and phone shells, there's still every possibility that a company case designs. designs. Anyone can make a case. Anyone can make a case design. And then I, I keep coming back, you know, when we were convinced that the iPhone was going to have a sapphire screen and MKBHD was extolling the virtues of scratch-proof phone screens, and Apple never made that move. It, I'm sure they, they were... tried to. I mean, I'm sure I don't they think that was to. a failing of the rumor mill. It certainly and, was going in that direction. And some leaked engineering samples, but Apple as a consumer company, what they were actually going to mass-produce to the tune of hundreds of millions of units, no, they, they never... That never happened. They never made that thing. Mm. So moving on to the next uh, mm -hmm. viewer email, I'll, I'll try and read through this real quick. Uh, this comes from Ganesh, and Ganesh writes, I'm planning to get myself a smart wearable. Uh, my options are an, a Jawbone Up, a Pebble Time, or a Moto 360 first gen. And I can't decide between a smartwatch and a fitness tracker. Does the Pebble mm -hmm. offer more bang for the buck, or should I stick with Jawbone that would serve me well on one purpose? Please help me decide, exclamation point. And thanks for the great show, as always. What do you think, Stephen? This is uh, this is kind of tricky territory. Yeah, uh, we're talking about different devices here at different price points with vastly different feature sets. Um, you can decide what you want to pay and then sort of work backwards to figure out what you can do to optimize what you get for that money. Or you can decide the features you want and then try to get the most attractive device or uh, the most affordable one for that. You know, you know, if you want a fitness tracker or you want to run apps on your phone, you have to make your mind about that. So there's a couple ways to come at this. I, I think that you're going to get more bang for your... Unless you're really, really fitness-focused and you can uh, get more out of a device that has a lot of uh, very specific uh, you know, workout-driven sensors. If it's doing things like um, measuring heart rate, which, again, a lot of smartwatches, uh, more full-feature ones do. Uh, if it's like doing you know, skin conductivity or anything. I pulled up the job on real quick and it has some very fancy... Uh, sensors embedded in the uh, wristband there. If that's important to you, then it might make sense to go with a dedicated fitness tracker thing, or even something that's more well-rounded, like a Microsoft's band. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that for the average user out there, you're going to get the most success with a you know, capital S smart uh, wearable, something that's Android Wear, or even the Pebble. Pebble's a good compromise on price. I maybe wouldn't go with the Moto 360 first gen, even though it's become uh, very affordable lately, um, just because it's getting a little long in the tooth, yeah. and you might be better off with another affordable um, Android Wear model, maybe like a, a, a Zen Watch or something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you got to make a mind about what you want feature-wise before we start looking at you know, what your options are. Yeah, and I, I just want to reiterate and circle back to your very first point. Whenever we're looking at comparisons like this, because your comparisons are encompassing the entire smartphone, or I mean the entire wearable market, you know, anything you can strap to your wrist, it's, it's a pretty wide uh, field to be taking a look at. Set your budget mm -hmm. first. Set a dollar amount that you refuse to go over. 
And I think that's really going to help you sort of narrow down some of your options. For, for all gadgets, I really, I really am a big proponent of look at your finances, set a dollar amount, don't go over that dollar amount, and then see if you can maximize the purchase for that dollar amount. Don't, hmm. don't, don't try and convince yourself, well, maybe I can spend another $50 and get something better. No, don't do that. That, that way lies to financial ruin. Hmm. And then so, for the others, I, and I completely agree. The Moto 360 probably wouldn't be my first pick. I don't think it was the snappiest watch of its generation when it first came out. Yeah, um, freaking so I would I would look at some of the other options there. I'm a big fan of Pebble Time, but again, it's also understanding the limitations of the Pebble platform and understanding that um, you know this this is sort of a third party uh, solution which isn't going to integrate as well as Android Wear mm -hmm. will for an Android device. But then it, again, like like Steven said, if you're fitness focused, get a fitness tracker. I don't wear this to dinner parties. I don't wear this all the time. But when I'm on my exercise bike, when I'm out for a jog, um, when when I'm even just taking a walk and I just want to listen to podcasts and stuff, this thing is on my wrist to track my fitness um, metrics. And then when I'm done with it, I take it off. <laughs> so uh, that that uh, you know, I, to kind of agree with Stephen and to kind of fill in uh, on on what he mm -hmm. was uh, on what he was saying, I think that would be probably the best strategy. And Stephen, would you mind tackling listener mail three while I go off mic for just a second to um, cough? Really Absolutely, well. but this seems super up your alley. So no, I just need a yeah, second. So I'm yeah, just gonna yeah. mute for a second. Uh, Cyril writes in, I am wondering, what's the point of having great photographers and amazing cameras if at the end, this is on smartphones, you need software to edit your pics anyway to make them look good? Well, that's because taking pictures isn't just about capturing the world out there. You know, if we wanted a, a camera that just made a perfect recording, uh, what well, we'd use something, I guess, like the uh, those 360 or spherical cameras that had <laughs> like no do really it I love I love that we're gonna we're gonna coin that now I need everyone from here on out to start calling these cameras spherical, spherical cameras. cameras but like something that would just capture the entire scene with no editorial insight there that had just like a very flat I guess audio we talk about flat response curves I guess <laughs> uh, very even spectrogram whatever uh, ca accurate color uh, capturing would be represented by but that's not what we want when we take pictures we want pictures that uh, that evoke a mood, pictures that you know focus on the subject. Framing is very important here. Uh, we play with color levels to make certain things pop, to emphasize the background maybe. We do focus tricks to make things stand out or to not stand out. And by playing with, by editing these photos, we get to make these decisions uh, at a time when it's more convenient. Because when something's happening right then and there, you want to take that picture, you want to capture the moment. You don't have time necessarily to get everything set just mm -hmm. right. So we want a camera that is flexible enough to, very fast, and to, this is why we love raw mode so much, because it just captures all this information that we can then work with later, and then tweak things to get exactly how we want to, remember things we wanted to, to get the point across that we want, and, and software, it's just it's so much more, it empowers us to get the result that we want than even the best camera in the world could if we're taking it right in camera and not being able to retouch it at all. Absolutely spot on, Steven. See, I like you you nailed it. Mm. Totally nailed it. I to 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 wrap up Steven's point, photography is a is is an art. You need an eye for composition, you need an eye for color, you need an eye for light, but it's a technical art. So even in this day and age when we talk about things like Photoshop, you know, like, oh, when you had to take that photo off the camera and then do a whole bunch of things to it. Back when we were working with film, there was a lot of subjectivity in how you could expose a photo. You know, if you, you even just shooting in black and white, what style film were you using? Were you using Kodachrome? You know, because that's going to have a very different color feel than um, a Fuji film does. Dilford, yo. Right, word. Um, so, and then, you know, just in how you exposed it, did you expose it brighter? Did you expose it darker? And then there was plenty of, you know, <laughs> airbrushing on past photos wow. before we had Photoshop technologies. This is, uh, there has always been some notion of image manipulation so that we achieve the vision of the artist less somehow photography being some objective truth, always a, a <laughs> representation of a moment. I mean, there's definitely a, a difference in, in mentality when we're talking about photojournalism, but even photojournalism has the problem of what did you point the camera at? Yeah, and just choosing when you take the photo. Exactly. You know, a quick second later, you get a very different story. 
Oh, totally. And so, so Sierra, I mean, like, uh, I, I know, and especially when we're talking about cameras, I spend a lot of time talking about smartphone cameras on, on this channel. Um, we, we still need to kind of factor in, you know, what it is that we do before we present an image, what is it that we do before we share an image. And that's a part of the photography process. So all of that goes hand in hand, and exactly what, what, what Stephen was saying, you know, what you, what you see is always someone's emotional content, not someone's objective truth. <clears throat> well said. So, um, that was a lot of talking. I think we can wrap this puppy up. Man, your voice held out. Hey, hey. <laughs> so close. So close. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, I couldn't hear the music, and I'm like, my ear playing, y'all. <laughs> Stopped up too. All right, so there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. The show is ending, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Stephen Shank as at Stephen Shank. Jules Wong is at Point Jules. And I'm stuffed up. You're at some gadget guy. Mm-hmm. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, and our home site, PocketNow.com. We're basically everywhere, and we're watching you right now. Shows like this can't exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology, and by dropping some reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever podcast reviews can be left. And if you're watching this on the YouTube's, hit that thumbs up button for a little extra positive reinforcement. You can write to us directly for a chance to have your questions answered live on the air using the email podcast at pocketnow.com. Once again, please check out that survey, podsurvey.com slash pocketnow. Um, the answers you provide will pair us with sponsors, which will help us keep the lights on, and you might win yourself a $100 Amazon gift card. Ultimately, there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you check back in. <laughs>